Colossians chapter 2, everybody. The Bible's in the back, reading from the ESV. Colossians chapter 2 is our scripture lesson. Um, Verses 8 through 15, our sermon series is called The Supremacy and Sufficiency of Christ. So I will read our lesson, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, from the ESV, God's authoritative, inspired word to us. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, as Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. We, we just sang about that. What a, a, I'm just so thankful to be in a church uh, that loves to sing of the beauty and the glory of Christ. <coughs> just so thankful for that. I had water here somewhere. All right. Thanks, Bob. He moved pretty fast. You saw that, right? <laughs> yeah. Bob and I go way back. Okay, Colossians, where are we at? Now, remember, the Apostle Paul is the human author. God, by the Spirit, moved him, his servant, uh, into this very, really interesting and insightful teaching on the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. He did it because, Paul wrote this uh, letter because a, a pastor by the name of Epaphras from Colossae uh, went to visit Paul while he was in Rome, incarcerated in Rome. And he told him about a lot of things that were going on in the church that were really good. But he also talked to him about some things he was concerned about. Some false teaching that in, uh, came into the church diminishing the person and the work of Christ. Things like Jesus is not sufficient. That he's not supreme over all things. That he's not God in the flesh. That they needed to know more, to have a greater experience, a greater knowledge. Uh, to experience the, the real power of God, the salvation of God. And Paul began his introduction speaking of his authority as an apostle, sent by Jesus by the will of God the Father. And then rather get into, we saw our, a few weeks ago, rather get into the theological issues of the day, Paul jumped right into Thanksgiving, being thankful for the church uh, at Colossae. And then Paul in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, important passage of Scripture, exposes the truth, reveals the truth about the person and the work of Christ. His authority, his, his authorship and supremacy over all the cosmos. In fact, it says that he is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, firstborn from the dead. And in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. It's Christ alone who reconciles all things, Paul says. All things in, in all of the universe and also sinners to himself, making peace through his death, the blood of his cross. And then in chapter 1, verse 24, through chapter 2, verse 5, Paul speaks of his ministry to the church. He speaks first of his ministry in general to the churches generally, and then specifically to the Colossae church. To the Colossae church. Speaks of Laodicea, Hariah, Hariah. Heriopolis, Heriopolis, two churches in that area. He mentions them as well. And he says to the church that he's been given the privilege to reveal the mystery of Christ to the Gentiles. The hope says that Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Verse, chapter 2, verse 3, that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul goes on to say that he's rejoicing in his toils. And getting this message out and serving the churches, both in general and to the church of Colossae. He's suffering, but he's rejoicing in his suffering as he toils and struggles as a good steward of the gospel. 
Helping others to mature in Christ, chapter 1, verse 28. But he's still concerned. You notice like in this backdrop of all that Paul is saying about Christ, about his ministry, there's still this concern about the church. He says in chapter 2, verse 4, I'm saying all these things about Christ, about the gospel ministry, chapter 2, verse 4, that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, being deceived through false reasoning, being deceived through this convincing speech. We said last week that no matter how reasonably fair an argument may be, if, against, if it is against Christ, if it is against the gospel, it must be rejected. For in the end, we don't stand on good arguments. We don't stand on logical reasoning. We stand solely and finally on the word of God. Doesn't mean that scripture is not logical or historical. It is. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't think deeply. We should. But what it does mean is that our experience and human reasoning does not substitute, should not contradict, or have authority over the word of God. Paul's concerned about them, about their arguments and, and, and things that are going on. And then in chapter 2, verse 5, he encourages them. He said, Look, I'm not there with you. He's never met them, remember. But he says that he rejoices to see their good order, verse 5, to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ, the doctrinal order, the standing firm, the solid foundation in the truth, their faith in Christ. Last week, we ended in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, and I mentioned that, that verse 6 is really the, the centerpiece of the book. In fact, our scripture today, verses 8 through 15, flows from Paul's exhortation, which we saw last week, to walk in him, or to walk in Christ. Paul is saying, everything you know about Christ, walk in him, and, he's, and he'll continue that on today's text. But before we go there, turn with me to, to, two 16, to chapter 2, verse 6, just for a moment. I want, I want to run into this text. Paul says to them in chapter 2, verse 6, As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord... As you receive them, as you came to understood, understand everything about the person of Christ, his lordship, his, his supremacy, his deity, his supremacy over all creation, his sufficiency and all that he's done. As you received him, Christ as Lord, so walk in him. Appropriate the doctrines. Take in for yourself this body of truth regarding the person and work of Jesus. Don't let anybody diminish what, what has been said and what has been revealed about who he is. Walk in him day in, day out. Live in union with that Christ, the one who is Lord over all creation. How do we do that? We said being rooted in him. I mentioned last week it's the Greek, uh, Greek perfect verb, which means that it had, they had their roots in him in the past, and it's continuing to be firmly anchored in him. And I mentioned that it was the passive voice. I usually don't do that, but what's interesting is that God's doing the work. God has rooted them in their conversion and, and, and has continued to keep them rooted in him. And what does that look like? It says, you know, the result is being built up. Again, continuous action. Being built up. So one was, excuse me, one was perfect, being, being locked in in the past with present results. This one being built up is continuation. It's a present verb. Continuing, we're being and continually being built up. Passive voice. God is doing the work. Established in the faith. Again, continuous, being rooted, being built up, being established in the faith, strengthened in the body of truth that was delivered to them. That's what he's saying. Paul's saying, look, walk in deep rooted in Christ, be, 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 be established in the faith, being built up in the faith. And then lastly, look what he says, abounding in thanksgiving. And what Paul does here, and it's important to see, is he switches from the, from the passive voice to the active voice. And what Paul is saying is, God is doing the work. He has rooted you into Christ. He is the one that's building you up. He is the one that is not just building you up, but establishing you in the faith, has given you the revelation of who Christ is. Your response, ask the active voice, your response then is to respond. You're doing the action. Respond in thanksgiving, an abundance of thanksgiving and gratitude, which would be a hallmark of our faith. The reason that gratitude and thanksgiving is a hallmark of the Christian faith is because the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is grace. Grace alone. Nothing we've earned, nothing we have done, but God in his love toward us has sent his son as a sacrifice. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And family, no matter what you're going through today, no matter what hardship or difficulties or trials you may go through today, nothing is compared 
nothing is, and I've been through hard times. I'm, I'm simply saying nothing what you're going through is compared to eternal separation from God. For eternity, nothing compares to that. That in us helps us to bring joy and thanksgiving and gratitude even in the midst of difficult times. Difficult times is part of the life here on earth. But he says here that we should have an abundance because of all that God is doing. Okay? And now what Paul does is he moves into more what it looks like to walk in Christ. As we pick up in, in verse 8, we'll see things to avoid, and then we'll see things that we need to know. As we're walking in Christ, this is what you are to avoid, and these are the things you need to know. And first thing he says is to walk according to Christ. Then he'll get into walk in this newness of life. And Paul goes to... An, a great length to show that we've been given new life and then finally walk in forgiveness and freedom. So that's where we're going this morning if you're taking notes. So walk according to Christ. Verse 8. I don't want you to be captive by philosophy and empty deceit. As you're walking with Christ, don't be, cap don't be captivated by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. It's Paul's concern for this little church. He's concerned that the dangers of these false teachers that are infiltrating the church pose a, a problem, actually captivity for those who would follow their ways. Paul said early in chapter 1, verse 13, that we've been delivered from the domain of darkness. And we've been transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness from sins. And now Paul's using this imagery for these believers that, that can be possibly taken away from the gospel into this slavery of error. How does that happen? It happens when believers believe a lie. When, when believers believe a lie, and, and, and it happens through the deception of that lie. And now believers cannot be the possession of evil or an enemy of God. We belong to God. But when we believe something to be false, when we believe a lie about God or we believe a lie about ourselves, we can be taken captive of the enemy. Paul said the same thing in Galatians 5.1. He said this. He said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul's concerned about this church. He's concerned about them going back into, into some false teaching and being brought into slavery. First by philosophy and empty deceit. Now, now Paul's not talking about all philosophy. But that philosophy we'll talk about in a minute. But that philosophy that... that takes us away from the infinite worth of Christ as the final source of fulfillment, truth, and satisfaction. That philosophy. Philosophy means a pursuit of wisdom. He's not talking about all philosophy. There are things about theories about God, the world, the meaning of life. All that is called philosophy. What Paul is talking about is their philosophy that is against the gospel. Philosophy that does not line up to the faithful teaching of Holy Scripture. Such that such philosophy is empty deceit or empty deception because it's based, look, on human tradition, on man's tradition, not the word of God, not the, not the body of truth that was delivered to them. Second, because it's based on elemental spirits. You might, your version might say principles of the world. And third, it's not based according to Christ. All wisdom, all knowledge is to be finally seen through the lens of Christ and Christ alone. That's what Paul is saying. One commentator said this, and I think this is so we could kind of wrap our heads around what Paul is saying. He says this, if by philosophy we mean the search for clarity, understanding, regarding the whole, reality, the whole of reality, then the Christian must, in a sense, philosophize. That's a word, I looked it up. He must think clearly, and he must strive for a self-consistent view of oneself. In this quest, however, he must always submit to the guidance limitation, and criticism of the light of divine revelation. He goes on to say, on the other hand, if we mean philosophy and we mean human speculation regarding man's basic questions without due respect to the revelation of God, then the Christian, no doubt, will accord this philosophy a greatly diminished relevance to his life and calling. In other words, if it's about human attempts to arrive at some truth without the revelation of God, 
to solve life's problems, it is fallen and it is deceitful and it is worldly. The gospel, the good news of Christ, comes from outside of us, not from within us. It is a revelation of God. And human beings and, and men and women have been searching and searching and searching and speculating and speculating and speculating, groping in the dark to try to figure out apart from God, apart from his revelation, apart from his enablement by his spirit to figure things out. There are plenty, excuse me, plenty of philosophies perpetrated by different men and women throughout the ages, whether it's Aristotle, Socrates, Nietzsche. David Hume, I am by no means a scholar on philosophy, but the bottom line is they're trying to get you to see, us to see, the world from their perspective, okay? And I think it's important at least to say this for us this morning. As Christians who stand upon the word of God, we are to, and we are commanded to, see the world through the lens of Christ, According to his word. Now, if you're not familiar with a worldview, a Heritage Dictionary says a worldview is the overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world. A collection of beliefs about life, the universe, held by an individual or a group of people. A person's worldview tries to give reasons for how all the facts of reality relate to each other and tie in together. A worldview answers questions of things like, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Where's my purpose? What is my purpose? How am I going to live? What behaviors should I exhibit? How do I know what's right? How do I know what's wrong? Is there a God? If so, what's my response and who is he? Paul's exhortation is to avoid empty, deceptive philosophy that tries to answer those types of questions apart from the word of God, aided by the spirit of God, rooted in the gospel. His name is Jesus. And that includes what he says here, elemental spirits or principles of the world. That's either the elements of the world, things like stars, moons, uh, you know, those people running to horoscopes and believe that some sort of position of some planets and stars actually control human destiny. It's wicked. Some people see this as strictly demonic powers. I think it's both. I think when you're, when you're worshiping the created thing rather than the creator God, First Romans 1, you're living a lie. They're trying to get your, your mind, your allegiance, your thoughts off of Christ alone and place them into something that is not according to Christ. We ought to see all of life through the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. We are looked to nowhere else for our salvation, for human flourishing, the answers to that are that run deep in all our souls. God placed it there for us. Why am I created? What's my purpose and meaning in life? How do, how do I get my longing for love and satisfaction and meaning and significance fulfilled? That's that is given to us so that we can seek Him. And find our joy and satisfaction in Christ. And the main reason Paul gives not to walk in falsehood, but according to Christ. Look at verse 9. Because in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He said something earlier in chapter 1, verse 9, similar. He said, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The, the temple of God, if you remember back in that verse, the dwelling place, the dwelling of God, the temple of God where they met with God. Now Christ is the embodiment of God himself. If you have an NIV, I think they, I think they really do make a good translation of the Greek here. It says, for in Christ, NIV, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. The fullness of deity was Paul's way of of stating that Jesus is every bit God. He's referring to the Son's uh, complete equality of essence with the Father, as substance and essence with Him. Hendrickson is a well-known commentator. He says, it can be said that this fullness of the Godhead is embodied, given concrete expression, fully realized in Christ. This is but another way of saying that from everlasting to everlasting, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, end quote. That's exactly what Paul is saying. And Paul's argument or Paul's revelation of what Paul is giving to the church, 
really destroys the idea that what the, what the false teachers were teaching, that the fullness of God came through some sort of legalism, saying, came through some sort of ritualism. We'll see all this next week. Asceticism, emanation, sort of these angelic uh, mediators. But he says it is in Christ that we see the panim, the face of God. Christ is the sole temple of deity. All the glories are manifested in him. And he's exhorting them, and he's exhorting us with this message today. Why, why go where anywhere else? Why go anywhere else? To experience the fullness of life, to experience salvation, to experience the fullness of forgiveness. When we run to Christ and we cling to Christ, it'll keep us from being taken captive by deceitful, empty philosophies. But there's something else in this verse and before we move on that I want us to see. Look what it says. And you, verse 10, have been filled in him. That's an amazing statement. Who is the head of all rule and authority. Christ, full of deity, fills us. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. I mean, he's talking about this union we have with him, this, this completeness we have with him. His fullness, we are in his fullness when we are in Christ. Not that we become God, but our union with him is how we, how we grow. Our union with him is how we grow and we flourish and mature. We find everything in Christ. There's no mediator between Christ and man. But Christ himself, there's no other media, I should say. There's no other means of grace or resources which he does not provide in his word. We are complete in him. He's the head over all rule and all authority. Everything is under his authority. Therefore, why run to something else? Why run to other things? Why go to some teaching, some, some teachers, some alien power, thinking they can do something for us when Christ and his fullness is in us. What does it mean to be rooted and built up and established in the faith? Avoid foolish, speculative viewpoints, philosophies that take our eyes off of Christ and trust completely and solely in him. Walk in him. Second, walk in newness of life. Look at verse 11. In Christ also... You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the flesh, but the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful work of God who raised him, Jesus, from the dead. Now, most of you know this, maybe some of you don't. For the Jews, especially in the first century, in rightness, circumcision was, was a foundational um, uh, identity badge for the Jewish people, the membership into the covenant of God required by the law. Every Jewish boy, eighth day, was circumcised. It was the first responsibility for someone who was a Gentile, a male man who wanted to become a, a, a Jew, a, a proselyte of the Jewish faith, circumcision was required. What Paul is doing here in verses 11 and 12, it's interesting. He's talking about the, the spiritual reality of circumcision and the spiritual reality of baptism, which is our new birth. Look what it says. The baptism, the, excuse me, the circumcision was made without hands. Okay, we're not talking about lasers. It takes part when the regeneration of God takes place. How do we know that? Romans 2. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. The reality, he says, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit. Don't want to get graphic here, but you understand what he's saying. It's a work made without hands. It is a cutting off of the old and putting on the new. It is taking the blinders off and seeing the beauty and glory of Christ. The putting off, the stripping, the removal. Look what it says, is the body of flesh. Sarx is the Greek word. Paul's talking about the sinful nature, the unregenerated heart that is inclined to sin, naturally to choose to do what we want to do or to rebel against God. And notice how spiritual circumcision is linked to spiritual baptism. 
The symbol, of course, or, or, the, or the ritual, of course, is water baptism. But Paul is seeing it very clearly in this passage of spiritual circumcision of the heart and spiritual baptism, which is being born again, being identified, being, being baptized, immersed is the word in the Greek, uh, being renewed, being found in Christ, Christ in us, and we are in him. Baptized in Christ. We're not talking about water. We're talking about spiritual renewal, newness of life. It's all over this passage. In other words, the relationship between these two signs, the Old Testament covenant sign of circumcision and now the new covenant sign meet together as we come to faith in Christ. You see, back in Genesis 17, Abraham was given a sign and a seal by God. The seal of promise and the covenant made with him, that sign was circumcision. And circumcision became to really just serve the Jewish people and to Abraham particularly that God would fulfill his promises. It was a sign of a, that God would do what he says he would do. And now Paul says here that you have been spiritually circumcised, made without hands, and been given new life in Christ. You've been baptized. You've been immersed, placed into, identified with Christ. That's, that's what that word means. Christ in you and you are in Christ, your union with him. And now because of this new birth, we have been given a sign, a seal for the promises of the gospel. We see that all over the New Testament. We've been sealed onto the day of redemption. That the Holy Spirit was given to us as a deposit. Same thing. In fact, in Deuteronomy, I looked up this verse this morning. Let me just read this to you. Even in the Old Testament, even the sign of circumcision, the physical sign of circumcision, really pointed to a spiritual renewal. renewal. Chapter 30 of, of um, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, I believe it's verse 6. Yeah. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's a New Testament promise. That's a new covenant promise. That you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. The circumcision of Christ was performed by God on our hearts. And look what it says. It was done by the circumcision of Christ. Interesting. Interesting metaphor. Speaking of his death. Speaking of his death. The imagery is particularly powerful because uh, the, the traditional circumcision of men in the Old Testament involved the cutting off of this, of this flesh. While Christ's circumcision involves the sacrifice of his entire body given to us on the cross. Isaiah 53, 8. He was cut off. Out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. That's the death of Christ. And then Paul moves from that spiritual reality to, to this beautiful family. I, I hope you see this. The beautiful, beautiful union that we have with Christ in our spiritual baptism. Look what he says. He says that, verse 13, excuse me, verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. Believers who experience this new birth are considered to be what? Buried and raised with Christ. It says the same thing in Romans 6. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Paul says the same thing in Romans 6. As believers... We spiritually share in Christ's circumcision, that is his death. It's the putting off of the sinful nature. It was cut away and now we have life. Dr. Peter O'Brien. As the burial of Christ set the seal upon his death, so the Colossians' burial with him in baptism shows that they were truly involved in his death and laid in that grave. It is not enough. Excuse me, it is not as though they, they simply died like Jesus died or were buried as he was laid in the tomb. The burial proves that a real death has occurred and the old life is now a thing of the past. We are raised in newness of life. And Paul would say the physical sign of circumcision is not important. The cutting away of the flesh of our sinful nature, the renewal of God, the power of being born again, being, being uh, united with Christ is what matters. 
We've given the ordinance of the ceremony, if you would, of baptism, Lord of baptism. It's an outward sign of an inward reality. It's, a, it's to mark the spiritual transformation in our life. And Paul would say, look at your baptism, your spiritual baptism. You're being immersed in Christ. You're united with him. Remember, there were, we'll see this next week, there were people in this congregation that say, look, you need to follow the law of Moses. And I'm sure circumcision was right up there. In order to know God, you need to be Jew first and then become a Christian. We see that all over in the book of Galatians. But now he's saying we can walk in newness of life because in our union with Christ, we've died with him, we rose with him. Raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. The work of God who raised him from the dead. The work of God. That, that's a truth. That, that's a promise. That's an assurance of eternal hope for us. Let, let that sink into your soul. All believers through the resurrection of Christ, we have died to sin, for he has died for sin. He's raised to a newness of life, and we too can walk in that newness of life. And, that, and that's really what shapes all of our lives. If you have been born again, born anew, renewed, and, and what we say, uh, born again, you know, spirit dwelling within you, that's the newness of life in us. And the practical application for this is it's by faith alone, in Christ alone, in the gospel alone, and family, what we need to do according to this passage is to daily reckon our account as if we were dead with Christ, that we were buried with Christ, and that we were resurrected with Christ. There's a sense in which there's a final resurrection. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15. But there is also a sense that today, this morning, if you're in Christ, if you've been baptized by the Spirit, union with Him, salvation has come to you, then guess what? Resurrection is guaranteed, and you can rejoice in the resurrection of Christ and the identity you have with Him today through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our new life includes the penalty of sin paid for, the power of sin of our life has been liberated, power of sin in our life has been liberated and the presence of sin will be finally vindicated when we put off mortality and put on immortality that's our guarantee identify with him in his death burial and resurrection Paul is saying walking with Christ means walking in newness of life any man be in Christ no right it's a new creation Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I was talking to someone recently. And, and just considering for a moment how if God rescued us and redeemed us and didn't change our heart. It would be cruel. It would be cruel. Follow me. Walk with me. With that old, broken Twisted, sinful, wicked, rebellious, dead heart. But that's not what God does. I praise God for that. That he gives us new desires. He's taking away old desires. He's placing new desires in our hearts. And you may be here today and you'd be thinking, but I want to do this. I want to rebel. I want to do this. God changes your heart where you want to please him. You want to love him. You're, you're filled with gratitude and thanksgiving because God is changing us from the inside. I praise God for that. I praise God for that. All that we need is Christ, to walk rooted in him, in his fullness, for his work of cutting away our bondage, our sin, and placing in us a powerful new life that is working in us. That's what we need. Why would we run anywhere else? Walk according to Christ. Walk in newness of life. Walk in forgiveness and freedom. As you, and you, verse 13, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. In other words, walking in sin, walking in a sinful nature, in rebellion, unregenerated, natural inclination to sin. Guess what? That part of you is dead. But God. <laughs> I love those passages. But God. You were dead in your sins, but God made alive together with him. Dead people can't make themselves live, just in case you haven't noticed. Dead people don't come alive. 
unless God causes it to happen. Paul is like, think about this, family. Reflect on this. That you, me, yes, you, even you, so fear, so, so, so severely fallen, hopeless, lost, utterly corrupt, sinful, and rebellious, God's grace, life has come to you. God the Father gave us life. Look what it says, with him. Who's that? That's Jesus. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Singular and exclusive. The way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said in John 5, 26, but just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. You see, because of sin, the entire human race is under the penalty, the curse of death and separation. We can have eternal life only in Christ. So you have the supremacy, the sufficiency really here also is the exclusivity of Christ. And that can be a stumbling block. It can be a stumbling block. You see it all over. I mean, you talk about the exclusivity of Christ and the cross. People think you're crazy. They're going to say, you know what? You're narrow-minded. And your response is, yeah. Because Jesus is. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. One road, one way. You need me. You want to get there? You need me. You want eternal life? You want truth? You want wisdom? You want satisfaction? It's in Christ alone. And the believer's new resurrected life occurred. Look what it says. Having forgiven all our trespasses. What Paul is saying unequivocally is that reception and new life is not possible without God restoring his people to himself through the cross, through forgiveness of sins. All of us, he said, we're dead in our sins. Ephesians 2 as well. But through Christ's substitutionary death, while he, where, where he paid the penalty for our sins, we then receive life. We've not only been delivered from bondage, we've not only been given life, but look what it says. We've been, we've been uh, freed from the guilt of our sins by Verse 14, he canceling, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. In other words, the charge against us, our, our legal indebtedness, which stood against us because of our sin and our violation of God's law, has been canceled. He what? Set it aside. He set aside, nailing it to the cross. Forgiveness of our sins cancels the debt that we owe. Who among us could say, I followed all the demands of God? Who among us can say that we have done all that God has told us to do and not done what God has not said not to do? There's a debt. If you remember in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, when they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray, he said to them, part of the prayer was, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts. As we also forgive our debtors. Same word. A debt is accumulated because of sin, wrongdoing. It requires reparation. It requires making amends or restitution for damage done. Society functions that way. When you violate the law, you pay what? A debt. A debt that's owed. You get a speeding ticket, you're in debt. You commit a crime, you're in debt to the state or the government. When you finish paying you off your debt, you're what? Free to go. It's the way it works. And in verse 14, look, look what it says. A very important word. It says, the record of debt was canceled. That which was owed was canceled. What's really interesting about that word, it was used in antiquity uh, for a handwritten note of a debtor acknowledging their indebtedness. In other words, I owe you. I, Lou, owe you $500 signed by me, given to you. And it's the I owe you before the Lord. I have, I have broken your demands. I have broken your laws. And I owe you. Of course, my owe you to the Lord is astronomical. Right? It's a signed confession. Paul says that Christ canceled it, literally blotted it out, eliminated, gone, wiped away. That forgiveness is the wiping away of the debt that must be paid because of our penalty, our legal obligations that we deserve for our sins. The suffering we deserve because we have violated God's law, his legal requirements have been blotted out. The IOU has been washed away. 
on the cross. Praise God. The penal debt against sinners was removed while it was placed on Jesus who went to the cross and died for our sins. That's the debt. That's the record of debt. And the next really important word here is he set it aside, literally took it away, erased it. When a criminal was nailed to a Roman cross, they would have the, 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 the crime in which he committed nailed above him, right? So Jesus' crime was he's king of the Jews. Little did he know he actually is. But they would, put the, they would put the crime on top of the cross so everyone would know why this criminal is being executed. And when they nailed Jesus on the cross, Paul is saying that they wrote your sins and my sins on it. And then it was canceled because the penalty was paid in full. That, that means that sin no longer holds us captive because the penalty was paid. And the day that we said yes to Jesus, that we walked up to God and signed our confession, I've sinned against you, he erased it entirely, nailing it to the cross. God took that indictment nailed it to the cross, we signed it, and he erased it. That's what Paul is saying. And you know what's left? Not a trace. Forgiveness of sins, all our sins. He remembers them no more. Verse 15 to close. He disarmed, that word is stripped. He disarmed, he stripped them, the rulers and the authorities that put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. One of the reasons why Satan has this dominion or this exercise of, uh, of cruel dominion over the fallen human race is through the bondage of sin and guilt. We're trying to get rid of those damn spots. But Christ triumphed over Satan by removing the guilt and dominion of sin that, that made his reign possible. Christ unraveled completely unraveled their work and disarmed them. The evil powers thought they had him. This is a great victory for us. And yet Jesus on the cross and then the empty tomb achieves the greatest victory that has ever been known. Calvin says this, Paul with good reason therefore magnificently proclaims the triumph of Christ that obtained on him for himself on the cross. As if the cross, which was full of shame, had been changed into a triumphal chariot, end quote. The cross was not their victory. The cross was Christ's victory. He triumphed over them. And because of the cross, believers have the assurance that the evil powers have been disarmed. Not only disarmed, defeated, but they've been put to open shame. Now, it doesn't mean that we're automatically immune to the enemy. I told you, lies and deceit will get us trapped. Paul says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. How? To resist him firm in your faith. Firm in the faith, the truth. It's a truth encounter. And what Paul is doing here is drawing upon a common practice. When the Romans would have victory, what's called a, a Roman triumphal parade, they would have in Rome. And Romans experienced this victory. They would, they would bring in the enemies. They would be stripped of their power, stripped of their battle attire. And then they would be publicly marched out and exposed to mocking and to shame of the Roman and the Roman people because of their victory. And Paul is saying, listen, by the means of the cross, God's triumphal parade over his enemy is showing us, showing the universe, things that are seen and unseen, how utterly impotent they really are. How utterly helpless they really are. Paul is saying, listen, on the cross, the cross, the gospel, Christ himself is sufficient to completely and totally forgive our sins wiping away our sin debt. But also on the cross, the gospel, Christ himself has supremacy over all the earth. Heaven, earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him and for him, chapter 1, verse 16. Therefore, family, Colossian church, anyone that belongs to Christ, don't be taken captive again. He's disarmed the forces he disarmed those who, who fight against them. The cross of Christ satisfied God's demand of perfect obedience. He bore our curse, satisfied God's wrath towards sin, disarmed and put to shame our enemies and secured our victory as believers, triumphing over them. What a Savior.
What a savior. Don't listen to false teachers. Don't listen to those who say the law is the way. The way to, 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 to get into righteousness with God. Christ has won the battle. Christ lived that perfect life we could never live. He died in our place, a death that we should have died. He was nailed to the cross. And because of his substitution, we're no longer guilty of breaking his law. We receive forgiveness and grace. God's justice and his grace meet at the cross. God's justice and grace meets at the cross, satisfying his justice and showing love to the sinners. The result, forgiveness and freedom. In view of all that, why look for Christ in any place else? Why look to, Christ, to any place else but Christ? The band can come on and we'll get ready for communion. Family, listen to what Paul is saying. Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts the truth of this gospel, this reality. Don't be taken by human philosophies, the things of this world. We'll see more about that next week. Don't be taken. Don't, don't be taken into captivity from that stuff. Stand firmly rooted, grounded, established in Christ. In his word. In his word. Being satisfied in Christ. Recognizing that he died for sins. He rose from the grave. He lived the life we could never live. And that's what this table's about. This table is about the death of Christ. It is the fullness of Christ, the, 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 the satisfaction of Christ. All that Christ has done when he went to the cross and the bread represents his body that was broken. The body that was broken, the blood, the cup, the blood that was shed on your behalf. Don't let people, young folks in school particularly, Learn and grow academically, wonderful. Stand on God's word, the final say. Don't, don't let them, them misguide you. Stand on God's word. If you've trusted Christ, we invite you to the table. It's, it's, it's not a King Chapel table. It's not a Baptist table. It's, it's Christ invites you by the presence of his spirit to come and to confess sin, to repent of sin, and then to celebrate the forgiveness of sin. The band's going to play. Our hearts will be uh, getting ready as we just confess and repent. And when, when, when you're ready to come up, come down these two aisles here, grab a communion, sit back down, and then we'll partake of it together. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, I think we, I think all of us can say that we need to hear the truth and the fullness and the beauty of Christ over and over again. We search, we look, we run to things that are never satisfying. And the fullness we find only in him. And Father, our time of communion together as we partake of the bread, recognizing his body and the blood, uh, the cup which represents his blood that we shed. Help us, God. Help us, Lord. Please help us to see the incalculable worth of Christ. And if there are places we've been running and places we've been looking for satisfaction, for, for things that will never really give us what we need. Lord, we, we repent of those things. We confess and repent of those things. And we celebrate that you still love us. You still pursue us. You still care for us. You still forgive us. We pray that your spirit will help us to turn from those things and turn to you. So help this a communion, time of communion reflection and singing and praying, Lord. Um, just really uh, help us to, to see you, to run to you, to, to drink deeply of the gospel. And uh, that we would celebrate your grace and mercy in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.